Good day, everybody. This is Scott Richter. I am on the board of the MTA, and I have the privilege this morning of interviewing Ken Goudreau from Flowpoint Thank Capital you, Partners. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank you so much for your presentation this morning. Thank you. Um, Ken, talk to us a little bit about uh, a technically based, quantitative based product hedge fund that you have and how you were able to, to, to make that dream come true. And, and talk a little bit about the traction that you're able to get in sure, the marketplace sure. with this strategy. Well, you know, I talked about it a little bit in my presentation, but I, I would tell you that uh, I have kind of a weird path to kind of how I got here. So it started as a securities analyst, then I became a portfolio manager, then I ran a pension, um, and now I'm back to you know, my love, which is, uh, is, is running money. Um, along that path, when I was running the pension, I met uh, one of my partners, Chuck Trafton, uh, who's also a member of the MTA. Uh, we've both been members probably for about 15 years, and uh, we immediately hit it off, spoke the same language, language. so to speak. Um, and uh, we both, uh, I think, uh, connected because I think through every aspect of our career, even though our careers were very different, the one commonality was that we spoke this language of technicals. And I can say, in my career, I look back and it was such an important part of every career decision I made, even though the career paths were so different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, to, today, um, I think the reason that we're having the successes we are with our fund is because we have an agreed upon language that I think is different and gives us an edge. Let's talk about uh, the marketplace, for example. You uh, were in a position on the other side of the table, sure. choosing managers, yeah. Yeah. choosing uh, LPs, and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Talk to me about being on the other side of the table now and the challenges that you face there with the institutional community with, for example, uh, uh, turnover, yeah. for example, sure. uh, duration of your investments, sure. things like that, the, the kind of pushback you're going to get from an institutional investor. Well, you know, unfortunately, in, in I think we've taken this great challenge, which it is. It's a great, difficult undertaking to start any company. Um, but because I have seen kind of the secret sauce behind how allocations are made, um, I think we have an edge in trying to figure out the right way to approach it. Doesn't mean that ours is the only right way, but um, what I saw pre-2008 was lots of people, and Josh spoke to this in our presentation, lots of people approach allocators and say, listen, I'm the smartest guy in the room, went to a great school, great firm, great pedigree, um, trust me, give me money. And there was very little in just about every pitch book I saw about process. And the power, I think, of technicals is, is that we're very happy to show people our process, right? It's very much if X, then Y equals Z, right? Um, so rules-based, like Tom was talking about It's rules-based. Now, we do have discretion inside the rules. I, I like to say, and Chuck is going to laugh because I use this analogy, like, listen, we drive the race car, um, but we don't go around turns at 200 miles an hour, right? It's it's uh, it's a constant tweaking of when the turn comes, you act differently than the straightaway. Okay. So there's discretion within the speed limits, um, but we do have guardrails, um, and we wouldn't imagine riding without those. Um, but uh, as far as the way that we hope to win from the business perspective, mm -hmm. it is being very clear in showing people what we're doing so they have more confidence, even though we're a new firm, okay. right? So I, I don't think that that, that that doesn't mean you're instantly successful. It still takes time. But I think the more nowadays, the more that you can show people, and listen, not everybody's going to agree with what you do, right? Mm -hmm. If we meet 10 people, two of them are going to go, oh my God, like, I get it. Like, those are the people we're looking for. I and um, I think that there's a real need for uncorrelated returns right now. Um, and that's what we're trying to achieve, okay. is good performance but uncorrelated, uncorrelated returns. returns yeah. with the other assets in the portfolio. That's right. That's so it's right. a piece of the puzzle. It's a piece of the puzzle. And we, we're very clear with people. We're not the entire portfolio. We're a piece of the portfolio, right? There's a place for a, a Spider ETF, or there's a place for a long-only manager. We're, we're trying to hit a very specific type of volatility uh, in a really very specific type of construction. Mm -hmm. And there's some people that that either may be not sexy enough or, you know, uh, you but find the right fit. You got to find the right fit. And I ask you one more question. <clears throat> and uh, you alluded to your, your rules-based uh, organization, mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But you also mentioned <clears throat> how technicals uh, assist you, keep you honest with your biases. Oh, so yeah. talk a little bit about that balance between the signal and the actions. So, so Frank Teixeira, I think, does a really good job at educating people on how uh, 
how, how the bias is, and, and, and I think Tom Dorsey also did a good job when he was talking about flying the plane and not trusting the infant. You know, the biases are our enemy. Um, once again, we do use discretion, but it's within the rules, right? We're trying to give ourselves the highest probability of success. So mm -hmm. just to break it down to brass tacks, when we're looking for good long ideas, we want to be shopping in the neighborhood where most of those long ideas are healthy. Right? So we're not trying to buy uh, the best house in a bad neighborhood. We're trying to buy the good neighborhood. And I think that if we give ourselves a higher probability of shopping where it's... And, and we do deep fundamental work. What we say is, though, is we want to be in good fundamental companies that we think we can appropriately risk manage. And there's a big difference, right? Just like there's a massive difference between the economy and the stock market, right? And I think a lot of people are starting to realize that more and more every day. It's the same thing with the stock market. Uh, you can have good companies that aren't good stocks. You can have good companies that are very difficult to risk manage. Um, once again, doesn't mean they're not good companies over the long term, but we're trying to find good securities that we can also appropriately risk manage. And that's a big challenge. That's a daily, daily kind of grindy type of position. Um, there is no secret sauce. There is You have to literally grind it out every day. Well, let me ask you one more question. Sorry. I was, no, no, it's okay. Um, for the for the real technicians that want to get their meat hooks into uh, mm -hmm. uh, the process a little bit, give me a few of your thoughts yeah. on after security selection, managing that position. Mm -hmm. Okay, the how much the okay. position sizing. Yes, as Tharp might you know talk about it, Van Tharp who has written yes, about excellent. this quite a bit. Yep. How do you manage it through the duration of the trend? I mean, and think about it just so, conceptually. So this is the part that you talked much about how you incorporate volatility as well. So this is the part that's much more grindy than than most of the world wants to admit it should be, right? So. You go into a security and you, you have a bias, whether you know it or not, but there's a degree of bias, right? So I, love, I like to talk about Apple because everybody sure. knows. But the way I treat Apple today and the way I treat Apple a year ago or five years ago, three years ago, is different. It should be different. Should what be different. degree, I have no idea. But when I was an allocator, I used to say, hey, Mr. Manager, uh, what's your favorite stock? It has everything. It's the perfect one, right? Hopefully there is one. And they say this. I say, okay, three years ago, was it just as good? Yeah, it was a great company. It's a great co Okay, how much did you have then and how much do you have now? If the answer is, well, if I really like it, it's 6%. And if I really, really like it, it's 6%. Then there's something wrong, right? It might not. I don't have the right answer, but it's not the same. Because your portfolio is different. The environment's different, different. The stock itself is different, right? right? So the real challenge, I think, is not the stock. Right? Like, like I said, if we put Aetna up or whatever, most of the room would say, wow, what a great stock. Up and to the right, it's beautiful, it's up whatever percent this year. The question is, is how does Aetna relate to the rest of my portfolio and when do I, what's my position size? Almost all of our position sizing work has two inputs. And anybody who wants to talk about this is more than happy to talk about how we do this. Mm -hmm. It's the relationship of the stock by itself, meaning its relationship and most of its moving averages and volatility, right? Okay. So trending. So, trending, but not just trending. It's trending in how are the relationships between the short term, the okay. medium term, and the long term, right? Okay. So most people get stocks right in the long term, right? So I like Apple, and I'm fairly confident Apple will be higher it input a long period of time. Right. The question is, is what's the relationship between the short term, the medium term, and the long term so that you're alive to reap the benefits of the long term, right? right? So, so don't we, blow up. Don't blow up. So we right. scrub for the volatility mm -hmm. and how that volatility is in relationship to the moving averages, right? The short, the medium, and the term. And to, to, Dorsey, uh, to Tom Dorsey's credit, um, there could be long term stocks we like that just aren't, uh, aren't in a good position right now the volatility perhaps or just the the relationship between the short and the long term it puts us at a disadvantage mm -hmm. it's not that we don't want to be involved we want to make sure when that relationship is good that we're alive in there. to take advantage Got it. Of it. that's right and, it. and what some people will say it's market timing it really isn't market timing it's position management right if something's very very volatile it's very it's more difficult uh, to to manage the risk right it just is um, so we don't want to be punished uh, for uh, being in something that doesn't have the right relationship between volatility. So I, and I don't even like saying volatility is the risk. It's the relationship between the reward that's the risk. Right? If I'm being paid for the risk, a multiple of the risk, it's fine. I'm taking it. Right? So it doesn't mean we don't buy volatile stocks. Right. Uh, we just buy them in less size. Smaller, right. Exactly.
Very good. Ken, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. This is wonderful. I had a great time.